India Network. Thank you so much for joining us once more for another ECHO session. Uh, my name is Dr. James Chansa, and I will be facilitating today's um, ECHO session. Here with me at the Hub, I am joined by uh, Dr. Wupem Sonda, who's going to be giving us our didactic presentation. And our topic for today is HIV prevention in adolescents and young persons. A very important topic, um, considering as a program, we uh, sort of lag behind uh, where adolescents and young persons are concerned. Um, also with me in the hub, um, I have uh, Tambuyu and Esnat, our ECHO coordinators, and our very able IT manager, Chatonda. Um, at this point, I would like to just find out if our panel of experts are already logged in. Uh, we are going to be joined by Dr. Kapongo Simpungwe, Dr. Muya Muya, Mr. Ntula Simwinga, and Mr. Max Womumba. So if any of you have uh, already joined in, uh, you can kindly say hi to the network. As we wait for our uh, panel of experts to say hi to us, um, I would like to remind the network uh, to observe our, et uh, our echo etiquette. Uh, let us uh, remember to mute our mics when they're not in use and uh, to utilize the chat uh, when we want to ask questions or we want to make contributions during uh, the procession. I uh, would also like to remind uh, our network that the link to the register, the e-register has already been posted. So do kindly uh, fill in that register as that helps us uh, assess our performance as uh, an ECHO program. Okay, our program today will be divided into two parts. We're going to have the first part, um, which is going to be a didactic presentation, uh, which of course will be presented by Dr. Msonda. And then our second part will be a case presentation, which will be uh, shared by our colleagues in Eastern Province, uh, Mr. Arnold Skaniti, I hope you are on the call as well. You could just say hi to us if you are on the call. Um, our experts, has anybody joined in yet? It seems our experts are yet to join in. Uh, I think we'll, we'll call upon them once they once they do join in. Um, I think before we get into the thick of things, uh, we will request um, Etambuyu to give us a recap of what we discussed last time, and then uh, we can get into our didactic presentation. Etambuyu, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chansa. Good afternoon, Network. Uh, just a quick recap of last week's presentation. We are looking at bidirectional screening of COVID-19 and TB. This was delivered by Dr. Sulan Nimbiri and facilitated by Dr. Kozia Diambo. So just the summary key points, it was um, explained and discussed that tuberculosis, uh, patients with TB uh, are at increased risk of acquiring COVID-19 and the same uh, the opposite is the same. Patients who have COVID-19, they also at increased risk of having TB. Actually, uh, if a patient has uh, COVID-19, they can also uh, reactivate the TB, which is in its patent stage. We also looked at the similarities of the presentation of COVID-19 and TB, and the fact that these two can coexist. Therefore, it was emphasized that both diseases should be screened when a patient is coming to the facility to seek health care. We also looked uh, particularly on the advantage of book leveraging on these existing resources in these clinics. So we can take advantage as these patients come in, as they are coming to screen for COVID, we can also screen for TB. As they are coming to screen for TB, we can also screen for COVID. And therefore, lastly, there was need to, it was noted that there's need to scale up the capacity building of healthcare facilities, as well as to enhance index of suspicion among healthcare workers. This will allow them to conduct bi-directional screening for both the TB and COVID-19. That was just a quick recap. Over to you, Dr. Chansa. Thank, Thank you. you very much, um, Etambuyu, for that detailed uh, recap. I'm sure 
the network has at their memory jogged. And uh, remember, you can always access uh, the slides on uh, Slack uh, for your reference. I think uh, without further ado, I will call upon uh, Dr. Msonda to reintroduce herself and uh, proceed with the, with the presentation. Dr. Msonda. Good afternoon, network. Um, my name is Wupe Msonda. And um, as seen on the screen there, I'm the HIV prevention advisor at the Ministry of Health. But um, by profession, obviously, I'm a medical doctor, pediatrician, with a huge passion for, obviously, children and adolescents. Um, and I also happen to be one of the um, national GPV trainers and mentors, as well as a trainer and mentor in adolescent um, and pediatric HIV. So I will be taking you through today's um, presentation. I hope it will be interesting and informative. And um, I hope that it will jog a lot of interest because uh, particularly that we know that there's a focus on adolescents and young people, uh, both as Ministry of Health and I think even through our cooperating partners and worldwide over as, as this population is quite priority in terms of um, HIV transmission and HIV prevalence. So I'll take you through our presentation. So the session is we're first going to learn some key facts about um, uh, adolescents and facts that surround adolescents and HIV. We're going to discuss the HIV preventive measures that we have available for adolescents and young people. And then I will outline the areas of concern and existing gaps that are prevalent. At the end, we will describe what strategic interventions the Ministry of Health has for adolescents and young people pertaining to HIV. Some key facts that we need to know. Some of us might know these, but just to bring up our memory again, um, we know that um, when we speak generally, Zambia has been one of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that has been congratulated or given um, accolades for attaining the UN AIDS 1990-90 targets uh, by the end of 2020. We know that this was for the general population. However, when we dissect and go deeper, we see that for adolescents, this was not the case. For adolescents and pediatrics, this was not the case. We have not actually even attained 1990-90. I think as far as uh, the recent data is showing, I think we're about 88, 92, and maybe 85. So we still have a lot to do in this population. Um, and some more information is that when we look at um, statistics, only about 43.9% of adolescents who are aged between 15 and 24 correctly identified ways of preventing sexual transmission. So which means there is a knowledge gap. People do not know how to prevent the HIV. So knowledge about HIV people know, but in terms of prevention, you can see the statistics are quite low. 37% in young men, and 34% in young women, which is deeply concerning. Studies have shown that um, school-based sex education can be effective in changing the knowledge, attitudes, and practices that lead to risky sexual behavior. Um, and this is evident when we see that about 48% of young men and only 38% of young women reported using a condom at the last time they engaged in sex. So school education is one of the means and strategies that we will try to enhance to in increase the knowledge gap in this population. Some more facts um, are that we know that young women are, uh, hold the higher prevalence when it comes to HIV than it is to men. And specifically, young women who have two or more sexual partners in the past 12 months and this is more than those who have had only one sexual partner or no sexual partner. So those who have more than one or multiple sexual partners within 12 months are at higher risk of um, transmitting or attaining HIV. And also we know that the prevalence is high amongst women and men who reported having a sexually transmitted infection or any symptoms of an STI in the past 12 months. So having an STI puts you at higher risk of HIV, and we've seen that in the younger women and young men, this is um, prevalent. So we'll look at some vulnerabilities. What makes this population more vulnerable to in when it comes to HIV? We'll look at physical vulnerabilities. 
First of all, young people are more vulnerable to STIs, particularly young women. And this is because of the anatomical structure. So anatomy, basically science explains this because when we look at the cells that line the inside of the adolescent cerv cervical canal, we see that it makes it more vulnerable to infections um, and, and than the adult uh, cervical canal. So this makes them more um, at risk of having an STI, including HIV. We also know that because of hormonal changes, adolescents living with HIV are vulnerable to um, nutritional deficiencies. So not only are they under the hormonal changes that happen in all adolescents, but the fact that they even have HIV, which um, obviously we know has a lot to do with the diminished immunity. So this makes them at higher risk. So because they have higher um, energy demands that are imposed by the HIV infection itself. And we know that HIV, can contribute to a compromised physical and, phys and psychological development, which includes stunting and slower than normal growth. So this makes them physically vulnerable. When we look at psychological and emotional vulnerabilities, we look at some factors. Um, so a sense of invulnerability, willingness to take risks, makes the adolescents at high risk of um, physical, sexual and even psychological harm because they have that sense of you know, being free and uh, they consider themselves adults and they're high risky. So this puts them um, at risk of all sorts of harm. At this stage, they also become psychologically um, labile. So they tend to have mental health pro uh, problems and this, can in and this increases during adolescence. Because they're not, so, they're not so mature, we know that they're not yet adults, they're in the transition. So the lack of maturity, that assertive, uh, lack of assertiveness and communication skills makes it difficult for them to make wise or good decisions, particularly about their sexual health as well. And also because it makes it difficult for them to articulate their needs, because there's also need to withstand peer pressure. So all those things put together, put them at risk. And then also the unequal power dynamics between adolescents and adults. They're not adults yet, but they want to be treated like adults. They're no longer children, so they don't want to be treated like children. So those power dynamics also makes them vulnerable. And when we look at the social um, and, uh, and other factors that affect adolescents, so this is more to do with the environmental factors. So these include stressful life events, lack of social support, death of a friend or a parent, those who are in relationships, a breakup of a boyfriend or a girlfriend, these stressful life events can influence how they perceive life and what sort of risks they may take. At this stage in life, because it's a transition, they're concerned over their sexuality. Am I a woman yet? Do I look like a woman? Am I a man yet? Do I look like a man? I should act like a man. I should act like a lady. So all those things, uh, these, and then also even socially, they're being told you need to grow up, you're no longer a kid. So this sort of pressure affects how they will look at their sexuality and their sexual uh, behaviors. Then there's also pressure to achieve school or academic targets. I think we're all aware that, um, I think there's some statistics that have shown that last year we had about 36% of adolescents committing suicide. And this is because of failure to pass their grade 12. So that pressure they have to achieve also puts them under pressure. Substance abuse, this is the time they want to explore, they want to try alcohol and smoking and all other vices. But most importantly, family dynamics, and this is something we often ignore. For some people, suicide runs in the family, but then also parental involvement, parental relationships has a huge, huge, huge impact on the decisions they make about their self-confidence and even their lifestyle. So we'll look more about uh, parental involvement because I think this is one factor we don't usually look at. So some factors that hinge on the relationship between children and their parents and contribute to a children's moral development are relational equality. How well do they relate with their parents? So there's something that we call poor parenting. Poor parenting is where we, the parents are not hands-on with their child, but they expect other people to raise their child for them. And they expect society to teach them. We expect them to be taught at school. We expect the maids or the, our helpers at home to do the raising for our children, but you're not actually involved. And then anytime something goes wrong, instead of talking through it, the usual 
African stroke Zambian way is we discipline physically. So there's a lot of factors that we look at when we look at poor parenting. So these relations uh, and uh, yeah, these relations have an influence on how a child will perceive themselves and the decisions they make, especially on their moral development. Parental discipline, I've already spoken about it, how we choose to discipline our children, the physical, the emotional, what words we say. Some, some of us comfort ourselves by saying, I don't beat, but how harmful are the words that you speak into the lives of the children? Then we also look at proactive strategies. How proactive are we as parents or our parents in terms of noticing, is there a change in their behavior? Is there something going on with my child? And not just noticing, but being able to quickly identify and mitigate, come in before they make a huge decision. Most of the suicidal cases, when they did the studies, they would go back and parents would said, I noticed, but I didn't do anything about it. Oh, I saw something, but I, I thought I'll deal with it later. So those are the things we look at. And then most importantly, conversational dialogue. We know that in our, I'll speak for Zambian, Zambian culture, um, usually the parents aren't supposed to be your friends. So because of that, it puts a barrier towards communicating with our children. So those things also have um, a role to play in moral development of our adolescents. So now that we've looked at vulnerabilities, a lot of us wonder why is there so much focus on adolescent girls and young women? Yes, we know we're saying adolescents and young people, but we specifically focus on adolescent girls and young women. I think from the statistics, we've seen that girls and young women experience um, elevated risk of HIV infection. Um, I'd like to acknowledge at least uh, the PEPFA for helping me with this slide and putting this together. When we look at the DREAMS program, um, some information came out that about 26% of adolescent girls and young women reported their first sex as coerced. So the first sexual experience is actually not willingly, but it is coerced, physical. So obviously there's risks of HIV infection there. And 69% of our adolescent girls and young women have had sex by the age of 18. Recent statistics are showing the age of sexual debut, the age at which a child a girl first has sex in Zambia has now reduced to 10 years old. That's very alarming. And then further, when we look, 29% of adolescents and young women, especially young women aged between 20 to 24, who report a recent intimate, intimate partner violence. So about 29% of our young women are experiencing intimate partner violence. So because when we look at these statistics, they're alarming. And if you look at the table there, we look at the female versus male ratio. You can look at how many were HIV positive and what's the prevalence. You can see in males, it's much lower. And if you look at those aged 20 to 24, the young people, look at how high that bar is. We have about 7.3% HIV prevalence, which is very alarming. So therefore, this is why, in as much as we're looking at adolescents and young people holistically, we're focusing a lot on adolescent girls and young women. So we have a poll question, Dr. Chans. Okay, so we are going to launch uh, the poll question. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the, the presentation so far. It's very spirited and you can tell the passion from uh, Dr. Msonda. So our poll question uh, reads, uh, which of the following methods of preventing HIV in adolescents are correct? So we've got A, that reads social and behavior, uh, and behavior change communication, B, condom use, C, voluntary medical male circumcision, D, abstinence, and E, all of the above. So I'm just going to launch the poll and um, we are going to have about a minute in which we can uh, uh, participate. And I do encourage the network to actually uh, participate. So please feel free to start polling in. Does it? Does it? No. no. So we've got about 307 uh, connections on the network, and uh, it would be very nice to actually see everyone polling. So far, we've uh, only got about 15%, but it's rising. Okay. Oh, okay. I think I think that yeah I think there was uh, there was an 
era when when uh, this poll was uh, was actually made, we don't have the the, the last option um, on this poll. Um, I don't know if we can be helped by IT or the poll. <laughs> Okay, so we have a few more seconds before we, um, we, we close the poll. We still only have about 48% of people that have actually poured in. So you want to read the question? Yes, it's a yeah. different question. This is the... So read the, oh, okay. the new question so they can answer that one. All right, okay. So the um, I think the question is a bit different. So I'll just read uh, this question. So the following are methods of preventing HIV in adolescents, except A, social and uh, behavior change communication, B, condom use, C, voluntary medical male circumcision, D, being faithful to an HIV infected partner, and E, abstinence. So we can answer this question instead of the one that was uh, Read initially. Okay, so I'll be closing the poll very soon. Okay, we're closing the poll and we shall share the shall share the, the results from the poll. Take a bit of time. So as you can see, most uh, of the network actually thinks uh, D is the answer, being faithful to an HIV infected partner. And uh, we've got about uh, the same uh, number of people thinking A and E uh, are the same. And uh, we've got about 2% for B and C as well. So I'm sure we'll get the, the, the answers as we proceed with the, with the presentation. We proceed. So we'll look at what methods of HIV prevention are available. As you can see, there's a wide array of availability. We have abstinence, male circumcision, condom use, testing, being faithful. So we'll go through these individually and see what we have into, for adolescents. So their methods, these are the methods that we have for HIV prevention. We have social and behavior change communication. We have comprehensive condom programming, voluntary medical male circumcision, STI screening and treatment, HIV testing services, PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis, PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, which is usually we, um, is aligned to our post-sexual uh, gender-based violence management, and elimination of mother-to-child transmission of HIV. So we'll look at the behavioral interventions we have for HIV prevention. We'll start with social and behavior change communications. So social and behavior change communication, it aims to influence the social and behavior change. So basically influencing the behavior of uh, the population and how they interact socially. So this, obviously there'll be an emphasis more on certain key and priority populations or vulnerable populations such as the adolescents and young people. So what do we do in this uh, field? We basically encourage them not to engage in risky sexual behavior or any behaviors that will make them or inhibit them to make safe choices about having sex or even uh, negotiate safer sex choices. So some of the things we look at is we emphasize adolescents to have good behavior, but this is not limited to abstinence. It's been a long time since we spoke about abstinence. I don't know if we've forgotten it or we think it's now archaic, but in this field, yes, we are still insisting that abstinence, abstinence is still the best way of preventing because you're staying away. But we know that times are changing and our adolescents and young people are more sexually inclined. So what we are advocating for is please do abstain. And how are we going to do this is we de delay the sexual debut. We're trying to encourage them that why not stay 
chaste, be abstinent until you are old enough to make a decision, an informed, mature decision on when to have sex. So that's what we mean by delaying the sexual debut. We want to delay the age at which they will first have sex. Also, we're, we're telling them to be faithful. Those that are sexually active, the young people, will restrict the number of sexual partners that they have and encourage consistent and correct condom use. You will know that, we surpri be surprised to know that there's still a lot of people in Zambia, a lot of areas that do not know how to correctly use a condom. And even for those that do know how to use them correctly, it's inconsistent. Once they're in a trusting, quote unquote, relationship, all caution to the wind, they stop using the condoms. Other meth biomedical methods, we have condom use. And I think we know that condom use not only helps prevent HIV, but also against uh, sexually transmitted infections and teenage pregnancy. So this one has, is what we call the triple therapy. We have voluntary medical male sex circumcision, which has shown to have a 60% reduction in the risk of HIV infection to circumcised men. Elimination of mother to child transmission. So this one will look at preventing or eliminating new pediatric HIV infections to improve the survival of children and their mothers. So therefore, if we do well in the EMCCT, we'll have less children becoming infected and less adolescents who will grow up living with HIV. Other biomedical interventions, we have the pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is taking a pill every day to prevent HIV infection. Um, so this prevention tool is for people who do not have HIV, but at, at high substantial risk of getting it. So those who are in early marriages, this is more for the adolescents and young people, those who are involved in early marriages, in relationships where they're experiencing intimate partner violence, um, PrEP seems to be quite um, a method that can work for this population. Then we have post-exposure uh, prophylaxis, which I mentioned, will prevent one from, um, from getting HIV, after they've been exposed to the virus. And this is commonly for uh, GBV survivors. Other interventions, we have HIV testing. Knowledge is power. And I think we saw from our adolescents, knowledge gap is quite wide. So we've seen that adolescents who test regularly and are aware of their HIV status will make them more um, responsible on their sexual health and sexual choices. So we encourage HIV testing people to know their HIV status. And in this reign, we have, we seem, it seems that boys are less likely to be tested compared to girls. So girls have a higher testing ratio than boys. And we also look at STI screening and treatment because we know that STI, I mean, first of all, HIV itself is an STI. So screening for STI, um, all, all sorts of STI will also help us detect uh, HIV. Then we have structural interventions. This is where we look at what structures are in play, place, what things are there in the environment that can look, that we can, um, that influence HIV prevention. Promoting positive cultural practices. So we have to abolish certain things like sexual cleansing and all those things. So we have to look at those things that can uh, put girls at risk of having HIV. And I'm glad that at least in the Eastern province, we have some chiefs who've stood up against this and some of them are actually abolishing child marriages. So I think this is a step in the right direction. We also have to promote gender e equality by promoting girl child ed uh, education and including girls and women in um, decision-making processes. We also want to promote gender sensitive governance systems. So we want to encourage women to participate in community and political environment and government systems so that they can influence certain decisions and policies that will be streamlined and uh, more protective of young girls and women. Also the involvement of civic and traditional leaders in the community HIV AIDS response. And I already gave examples of some chiefs who've taken a role and have actually become our champions in this era. So I'll take you through some, some statistics from um, December last year, 2021, just to make you see how we're doing and how we're faring in terms of adolescence and HIV. We look at those who tested. As you can see, testing, look at how high those bars are. We had women, 
more females testing more than the males. And if we look at um, the testing, those who tested positive, okay, um, we had obviously girls or females testing higher, higher numbers of positive cases than in the males, but they are also testing. So do we know, we, we're not sure if this is a true picture. Is it really that we have more girls becoming who are HIV infected or is it because we're not capturing the men and the boys testing them and knowing their true HIV status. So this is something we can discuss. Provided with PrEP. As we can see that obviously those below 15 years, obviously uh, uptake of PrEP, not really, but above 15 years, we can see uptake was mostly in the younger people, 20 to 25, and especially beyond the age of 25. And we can see the numbers there. So we can see that in the PrEP program, we're doing mostly well with the young people and not with the adolescents. But I think this can be explained by the legal barriers we have, that um, the legal age at which adolescents can have sex, which is 16. So maybe this could influence why the uptake of PrEP in this population is not as high. Here is what I wanted us to see. Condoms distributed, what do you see there? We see that male condoms basically are almost like 99 point, I don't know what percentage that is, but female condoms distributed, a minute number. So the uptake of female condoms are not, is not good. So already this can really show you how much negotiating power women have when it comes to sex, sexual behaviors or sexual decisions. Because if you can barely even use a female condom, what more other vices and how, how much power do you have to negotiate for safe sex? So this is a problem for us. Dr. Chance. So we're going to have our second poll question. Uh, allow me to just launch it uh, so that we just... Uh, Okay, so our second poll question reads, uh, integrated, oh, sorry, intergenerational sex and low perceived risk uh, to HIV infection is an area of concern for adolescents. This is a single uh, best answer, it's true or false. Um, I want to understand intergener intergenerational sex here refers to uh, probably a scenario where you have uh, a teen and maybe somebody in their thirties, is yes. that? Okay. So we're having large gaps or so generations dating each other. So where we have an older man, younger woman, or a young man, older woman. So where there's a generational gap <laughs> in terms of age between the two. Okay, so we'll just give it a few more seconds. Um, already a lot of people think it's true. Uh, we still have a number of people that are thinking it's false as well, but uh, uh, people are still pulling in. For those of us that are not clear, so the blessers and the Ben tens, <laughs> <laughs> is this a yes. huge problem for us? <laughs> okay, so we've got about uh, 30 more seconds before we close the poll. Please feel free to, to poll in. Uh, a number of people have actually poured in on this one, which is a good thing. Okay, so I'll be closing the poll soon. We've got about 67% uh, of the network that has participated, but uh, looking at uh, the way people have polled, um, this is almost, uh, it's almost one answer that has been given. So I'll end the poll now, and then uh, we'll get back to, uh, to the presentation. I'll just share the results, uh, just so we can see how we have polled. So 98% of uh, the people that polled in think the answer is true. And uh, uh, there's a fraction, um, a proportion of 2% that think um, this is false. So we'll find out as, um, as we go, with, go on with the, with the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Chance. So areas of concern, what are we worried about? Where are we having issues when it comes to adolescence? I already spoke about this earlier, the early sexual debut, the age at which our people are having sex. I mentioned recent uh, statistics are showing as young as 10 people are engaging in sex. So this is a huge problem. We need to go back to the days when it's going back to 16, the legal age at which one should have sex. 
we have a high infection rate of STIs. Um, I'm, I wish I had projected the number of STIs that we see in the adolescents and young people, but it is very high in this age. And I think we explained because of the anatomical structures that are aligned, especially for young women. We also have alcohol abuse and specifically drunkenness during sexual intercourse. We are recording a high number of uh, young people reporting drug facilitated sexual assault. That's the DFSA you see there. We're seeing a lot of cases where persons wakes up and saying, I don't remember. All I know is that I was given a drink, I was given something to sip on, and now they've been sexually abused. So this is a huge area of concern because of, the, of um, high infection rates, especially that most of them will come way after 24, 72 hours when it's too late to even give them PEP. So this is a huge problem for us. Transactional sex, where people are, especially the young women, even young men, are uh, performing sexual acts in exchange for favors, paying my school fees, paying for my hair, for my nails, paying for my rent. So we're having a lot of that going on. The, you know, prid quo, what can I do for you and you can do for me? So uh, this is a huge problem for us because especially when someone has done a big gesture, you have very little say in, make, in negotiating safer sex choices, whatever the demandee or the blesser would demand, you'll be very, it'll be, it puts you in a very difficult position to negotiate. So transactional sex is a huge problem. I already mentioned child marriage and the sexual cleansing practices, which are still going on, sadly, in some remote areas of Zambia, but we're slowly trying to change this. Intergenerational sex, we already discussed what this is. This is a huge, huge area of concern and it's becoming more popular by the day. We already spoke about the knowledge gap. A lot of uh, adolescents especially have inadequate comprehensive knowledge. When we say, we don't just mean knowledge, comprehensive knowledge on HIV itself and how to prevent it. And then when a survey was done, it shows that most of our adolescents and young people have a low perception of risk to HIV. A lot of them feel they're not at risk of HIV. They feel HIV is for the older people. And because of that, they engage in risky sexual behaviors. So these are the areas of concern. So what gaps have we identified? We have identified that our programming all the way from national to subnational level is siloed. We have HIV performing on its own, and then we have the sexual reproductive health and adolescent health as a separate program. There is need to unify these and look at it as a whole, because when we look at health, it's all aspects. It's the mental aspect, it's the physical, psychological. So we should be able to program these and put it under one umbrella. So this is the same at national and subnational level. We've seen that we've been focusing, the HIV response has been mainly had a female face. So because of that, we've left the boys and young men behind. So we need to concentrate on this population. How do we enhance prevention in boys and young men? How do we get boys and young men to be interested in their sexual health? For those of us that are practicing, we know that PrEP is basically limited to ART sites. And we know for those who are HIV negative, it's a barrier because they feel, why should I go to this area that is meant for people who are living with HIV? There's that stigma, that discrimination, and that discomfort. So we're trying to see what can we do? How do we improve this? We have a lot in most areas that are lucky. We have adolescent youth uh, friendly spaces, but in some areas it's inadequate. You find one in the whole district. And worst case scenario, in some places there's none. We have a lack. So this is a huge problem for us because where are the adolescents and young people supposed to be able to freely access information or any services? We've seen a lot of us produce flyers and posters, but what do we see? They're in English. But does everyone speak English? And what do we do for our persons with disabilities? So there is a lack of IEC and BCC materials in local language and for persons with disabilities, specifically the Braille. And most of our messaging is very, very generic. The same messaging you have for a married woman is the same one you're giving to a young girl. Our messaging needs to be age appropriate, gender sensitive, what you speak to a girl and a boy, 
and population sensitive for those who are living with disabilities or persons with disabilities. So that it's, we are lacking in this area and actually it's quite inadequate when it comes to adolescents in these different populations. A lot of our health facilities are able to manage or identify SGBV, but it's still quite inadequate. We may be seeing these cases, but how we are managing them leaves much to be desired, and we're still putting our adolescents and young people at risk of contracting HIV. We're also seeing insufficient STI diagnosis and management. We are very HIV-faced everywhere, that we've forgotten that STIs are also a problem, a huge problem, and we've forgotten other diseases. So we're seeing that there's been insufficient STI diagnosis and management when it comes to this population. So now that we've identified the gaps, what interventions have we put down, especially as the Ministry of Health? The first thing we've done is an adolescent surge. We've introduced an adolescent surge. So this is where we leverage on the adolescents themselves with programs that will emphasize them and empower them to take ownership of their health and their lives. So this is where the adolescents are going to be the ones championing, educating each other and running different aspects of the HIV program, especially towards prevention. So some of the things we're looking at, the objectives under the surge, is to intensify a combination of HIV prevention services with a view of reducing new infections amongst adolescents and young people, and to scale up combination of services to enable adolescents and young people to A, maintain the HIV status, and improve access to quality treatment and care services for those who are already HIV positive. So this is what we are doing under the surge. Sorry about that. Other strategies that we've put in place is we want to revamp and revise our youth-friendly spaces to widen the scope of prevention and services. I think most of us are aware that most of our youth-friendly spaces leave much to be desired. It's just a box of condoms on a table, and we say we're providing youth-friendly services. We want it to be all-inclusive, to provide all services or HIV sort of to be a one-stop shop for HIV prevention so that when an adolescent should go there, they should be able to have a widening array, both information and services. So those that are existing, we want to revamp them, revise their scope of work. And those that don't have, we will open some centers where we will provide this. I already mentioned um, messaging and also uh, social behavior change messaging. It needs to be comprehensive, age appropriate, gender and population sensitive. We need to enhance the knowledge and access to HIV prevention services for the adolescent, especially for the boys, young women, and uh, boys and young men, and even the adolescent girls and young women. We now want to see how can we delink PrEP service provision outside the ART sites? Can we start providing PrEP in the adolescent youth and friendly spaces? Can we start providing PrEP in other points of entry so that wherever a young person or it should go, they will have access to the services outside the ART site. And specifically, maybe even in the community. We want to enhance index and network, uh, social network testing. So we want to, do, not only will we look at people and their sexual partners, but who else exists in their social network who maybe they might be engaging in sexual behaviors with. So this is some, an, um, an aspect we want to introduce. It's fairly new, but it's something we want to really work on. We also want to improve the prevention and management of SGBV across the board in healthcare workers and even multidisciplinary for across the board for the police, everyone who's involved in the management of SGBV cases. We'd also like to leverage on existing programs that focus on adolescents and young women, like the DREAMS. So we'd like to see how Ministry of Health can leverage on such programs and expand the hand of offering services to our adolescents and young people. So we've already started this by having collaborative meetings between those who are partners who implement DREAMS and even in the provinces and see how we can leverage, identify areas and spaces or strategies that we can implement. So the summary of my presentation, the take home points will be that combination HIV prevention, including increasing HIV knowledge and access to sexual and reproductive health services for adolescents and young people is vital. So we're looking at not just one method, but a combination of HIV prevention methods. We've also been able to see that there are various factors 
physiological, psychological, physical, social, and environmental factors that affect adolescents. And this can influence their morals and also their H the HIV transmission. And there are also numerous methods that are available for HIV prevention for adolescents and young people. However, access to these products and services must be enhanced. So what we need to do all in all is enable adolescents to protect themselves and become advocates for HIV prevention. This is the end of my presentation. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Msonda. I think that was a very comprehensive uh, presentation and uh, we can all appreciate that adolescents and young persons actually require tailored interventions for um, improving uh, uh, HIV indicators uh, where they are concerned. So we are going to get a few questions or clarifications uh, for Dr. Msonda, but I would also like to just uh, remind our, our panel of experts if they are on the call, if they would like to contribute or just add on to what has already been shared to please uh, feel free. So you can go ahead and just raise your hand and we can uh, uh, call upon you to, to make a question, to ask a question or uh, make a comment. Um, Steven oh, Steven Chavula, please, uh, you can uh, uh, just unmute and uh, give your comment. Steven, are you with us? So as we wait for Steven, there's a... Um, a uh, comment from Dr. Mchimba Kaveta that says uh, PrEP and PEP provision should be coupled with uh, youth-friendly corners. This is an approach that would work for the youth, a, uh, a kind of uh, one-stop corner. And I think this was uh, emphasized in the, in the presentation as well. Thank you, Dr. Kaveta, for that one. So we've got another uh, comment from, unfortunately, this person did not rename their device. But um, it says uh, for female condoms, uh, it's the way it's the way they are made. I, th I think this is what it's mm -hmm. trying to say. Yeah, it's the way they are made because in rural areas, women refuse to to get it. Um, I don't know, Doctor Msonda, would uh, we consider the female condom to be a failed product? So. <laughs> um... I will agree that we've had problems with the initial female condom that was introduced. A lot of women expressed discomfort and also the, the prerequisites, the things you needed to do in putting it on. There was those theories about you have to put it on, I don't know, so many minutes or an hour before yes. sexual yes. Yes. activity. So now what happens when there's a surprise or one of those off cuff moments? So that, those are the few things we've had. But I would like the house to know that they're newer, female condoms available that are now more comfortable, that have done away with that. So some do not have a ring at the bottom. There's some that have a sponge. Some of them have a hook, but there's now a wide variety. However, I must put a disclaimer that these are socially marketed. These are the ones you have to pay for. The ones that are free are still the old generic ones. So I think what we need now is that because now that we've seen the safer or more friendlier female condoms are the expensive ones or the ones we need to pay for is we need to see how do we make these available to the average Zambian. So this is where we'll need a lot of public private partnership and also, <laughs> well, I hate to say implementing partners, partnership yeah. to come in to help us on this area. But as far as it is, I do agree with you. What is free and available is the old generic one which um, has come associated with a lot of um, issues. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Msonda. I think uh, even as we practice, of course, we can, uh, I think, give our adolescents and young persons the option to say they're actually newer uh, brands of these uh, female condoms that are a bit more comfortable, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? I think there was something on top there about condoms, something. Um, just check the chat. Okay, so there's uh, another question from, um, uh, I don't know, 
from Dr. Kaveta. Um, it asks, uh, does condom distribution parallel condom uptake? This information would be important when weighing the information provided by the condom uh, distribution slide. So would you like to make a comment, Dr. Msanda? Yes, so usually there's what we, we do, a condom distribution mapping, where we see where the uptake is higher. And I think already studies have shown that it's more in the urban than in the rural areas. And then I think um, distribution goes in tandem with uptake. So where it's used mostly is where we um, distribute. However, I think there's need to delve into the remote, into the community parts to see just how much is it, um, why is there low uptake? Is it availability or maybe even access? So I think these are the areas we need to look at um, when we look at a condom distribution. Um, I would just like to mention that even under the condom programming, we're looking at a new aspect, which is the last mile distribution. We know that condoms usually reach the provincial hub, but to get them to the district and right to the community, more so to the end user is where we're having a problem. So we need to enhance our last mile distribution to make sure that the end user really gets the product in good time. Thank you. Uh, we've got a comment from uh, Eddie Milimo, a wonderful presentation doc. I've also observed that uh, um, adolescent girls and young women on uh, ART find it difficult to adhere to treatment when in the company of their peers, e.g. boarding schools. Um, this uh, can lead to increased transmission of HIV. How can this issue be handled? I think when the, the case presentation is made, um, this is something that will be addressed. So we'll reserve this one for um, uh, once the case presentation has been made. I'll just read out a few more uh, comments and questions, and then we can proceed to our case presentation. I hope uh, the committee is ready. Um, are you on the phone? Yes, we are on the call. Thank you very much. So we'll be uh, coming to you very soon. So I've got another comment from Don Doc Chichi that says it's important if sample sample or adverts uh, be made public mm -hmm. so that even us as practitioners can be able to talk and encourage. Um, they are used with full knowledge. Thank you. I, I agree 100%. The condomized team is actually looking for, they've been looking for support to go out to start educating ourselves because I won't lie, I was only recently educated about all these wide varieties of condoms and lubricants. Mm -hmm. So the condomized team is just looking for support on how to go about this, do trainings both for healthcare workers and then also sensitize the community as well at large about the availability of these products. So I agree with you, thank you for that. Yeah, so uh, just another comment uh, before we go to the presentation uh, from Chiven de Luamba. It says most women or girls prefer the male condom than the female condom. Um, any insight on this one? No. It's the, okay, what I know from practice has been the same discomfort issue and all those requirements before. It was easier because the male condom, instantly you can use it. But remember the female condom had those issues. But I think with the newer ones, which work just like a male condom, we'll, we hope to see this picture change. Okay, so I think we can move on to um, our case presentation, which is the second part of our session today. Um, Mr. Scaniti, are you uh, ready to share the presentation from that end, or would you like us to share from this end? Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, network. Yes, this is uh, Charles Mlambia, the King commenter for, for Sangazi. Yes, Mr. Scaniti is on the call, but we would like you to share the presentation on our behalf from that end. Thank All you. right, okay. We we'll just request IT to help us with that. Uh, they would like us to share the presentation from this end. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you very much. All right, you can uh, proceed. Yes, please. We are Sangazi, so we will have a presentation done by Amostaniti, a clinician from, from, from Queen Erolo Center. Anna? I'm sorry, can you just move closer to the mic? Um, we are having difficulties. And the new text through. You ready to proceed? Okay, maybe he's having a problem with network where he's otherwise he's on the call. Maybe I can I can take you through the first presentation. Yes, please. If, if you can take it up, I uh, would appreciate that. Thank you. So this is uh, Charles Mulambia. As I introduce myself here, I'm the clinical mentor for Lusangas district in Eastern Province. So I'm presenting a case from coming from one of our rural health center, which is a, a case of JN. Uh, 17 years old, uh, who started on uh, LRT in uh, December uh, 2017. The client was uh, later on transitioned to, to TOD in uh, April 20, 2020 as per guideline. Uh, what is not of this case is that uh, this client had a uh, high viral load sample which uh, was collected on the 30th, on the 19th of January this year as a routine annual monitoring. And after we received the result, we informed the parents because this, uh, this client is not uh, at the parents' home as you will be able to, to hear later. So the past medical history of this client uh, is uh, that uh, apart from being uh, HIV positive, the client has no other uh, medical condition. And of note is that the child had a high viral load, uh, which was uh, uh, 2,090 copies per meal in 2019. A follow-up test was conducted three months later after four year sessions, yielding a result of a uh, target not detected. The current drug history that the, the client is on is, is TOD. The social economic is history of the client that is under discussion is that the girl is the first born in the family of two, uh, both parents and the young brother, that is the sibling to the client, are on ART. Uh, what happened is that the, the sibling was actually started on the, LRT earlier than the parents. The parents were kind of resisting to start LRT. So mother to this client is a class teacher and the child is currently at a boarding school and does not receive drugs by direct observed therapy by the parents or any other caregiver. The child claimed to be fully adherent on last visit when we interacted with her. She is actually sexually active and uh, was elicited as a contact and the possible source of infection by another teen who tested positive. You can move the slide a, a bit up. Can't. All, all right, the, the other point of note is that uh, this client she does, uh, does not take alcohol. Uh, physical, Examination did not review much as all the parameters were, uh, were stable. You can move to the next uh, slide. So this is uh, the, the profile of the viral load uh, samples which, uh, which, has which has been conducted on this client. 
So as you can see in 2019, August, we had a high viral load from this client. And after the four year sessions in 2020, we had the TND result. Then the following VL sample, which was collected in February 2021, uh, it came out as 142 copies per meal. And the latest one now being this year, collected the, on the 19th of January 2020, uh, coming out as the unsurplaced. Next slide. Thank you. So now our questions are, what DSD and the adherence support activities could be used for, could use for in this, in this girl, or in a child who is, a, who is in boarding school? The other question we'd like to be helped on is, how could the school administration at boarding schools be integrated to improve and promote ART adherence. Other question, what other issues should we explore from social history of this, uh, this girl? And what other services should this girl be offered? Uh, thank you and over. Thank you very much uh, for that case presentation. I'll just uh, give a brief summary of the presentation, and then uh, we are going to break out into our breakout sessions and uh, discuss the case. So this is a case of uh, Jane, 17 year old female, who has been on treatment for about four years now. Um, initially, this um, girl was on TOE, but was later switched to TOD in 2020. So the past medical history was uh, mainly unremarkable, except for the fact that uh, in 2019, uh, there was a history of a uh, high viral load, which was uh, 2,090 copies per meal. And uh, this uh, was suppressed after some enhanced adherence counseling sessions. Um, however, on routine uh, viral load monitoring, uh, the girl was found to be unsuppressed once more with a viral load of 1,350 copies per meal. And this was on the 19th, just last month, on the 19th of January, 2022. So the social history is such that uh, this uh, is a girl that is coming from a household that has both parents that are living with HIV and uh, also uh, a younger sibling that is also HIV positive. There's, um, the girl is in boarding school and uh, there's no history of directly observed therapy uh, while she's at school. She is currently sexually active and um, she was elicited as a possible uh, uh, source of infection by another team that tested positive. A physical examination was unremarkable. Uh, the questions again, what DSD and adherence support activities could be used for persons on treatment that are in boarding schools? And um, how could the school administration at boarding schools be integrated to improve and promote ART adherence? The third question is what other issues should we explore from social history? And the final question is, what other services should this young lady be offered? So this is a, a very typical example of a, a client that you would meet in your clinic, um, a young person that you'd meet in your clinic. So we are going to break out into our breakout sessions. We've got Lusaka, um, Eastern, uh, Western, Southern, and I understand the Northern uh, region is going to be joining the Lusaka um, the Lusaka uh, breakout session. Um, otherwise, uh, others can feel free to join whichever uh, session that they feel like joining. So I think IT, you could just help us with uh, the breakout sessions and we can proceed with discussion of the case. Thank you. Yeah, so the sessions, uh, let us remember for the provincial coordinators that will be coordinating the, the breakout sessions, uh, uh, because we have to keep uh, time into consideration. Let us uh, do our discussions within 20, 15 to 20 minutes uh, so that we can have a fruitful discussion afterwards and integrate everything. Thank you.
Okay, so the uh, the rooms have, have been opened. Uh, it, uh, it's up to you to uh, join in whichever room that you uh, want to join. And uh, for the coordinators, I would also like uh, to remind you to ensure that, that all the recommendations that are discussed are uh, written down and forwarded to uh, our hub here so that we can integrate everything and share it with our colleagues um, in Okuin. Have you named your device? Hello, Chair. Kindly assign me to Western Province uh, breakout room. I haven't seen the pop out here. Your name? Uh, Kaoma Pediatric ERT. Yes, this is Charles. Uh, Can I also be assigned to the Lusaka group? Uh, I can't see either pop out of my hand. <coughs> just, just give us your names so that we can assign you to um, uh, a room. So Max this is, the name is appearing on your device. Yes, Max or Mumba. Mr. Max, Max or Mumba, welcome. Max. Hi everyone, how are you doing? Good. Do I happy to hear you? Dr. you also assign me to Lusaka Group. This is Chilufia. Chilufia. Being assigned in groups, many in a Chirundu and Karazi. Uh, so welcome uh, Lusaka for uh, the Lusaka breakout session. Um, we got the case. Um, the floor is open for discussion. Um, I don't know if um, we, we probably don't have the, the presenter in here, uh, but we may ask some uh, questions to clarify. 
the case that we can uh, still forward once we uh, reconvene as a, as a session again. But we've got the questions that were asked. Uh, would anyone be willing to take it up with the first question? So I think the first question had to do with DST models. What DST and adherent support activities would be used for persons on treatment that are in boarding school? Mr. Chibende, Luamba, would you like to take a go at it? Dr. Mzungaire, I can see you on the call. Would you like to uh, make a contribution? Uh, Nathan Sinyangwe, please go ahead. Uh, Nathan, your hand is raised. You can go ahead and make your Yes, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Doc. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm clear. Very clear. Okay, yes, thank you very much. Me, it's in form of a question, and also I think answering the, the, last, the last question in terms of uh, other services that we can explore. Uh, I wanted to find out, me, it's with regard to eligibility for the OVC. I missed the 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 facility where the presentation came from i know we do not have ovc partners in some parts of the country and so i was just wondering to say are there or is there a partner within the catchment area or in the place that is offering ovc services and maybe try to check with the team on the social aspect if that was uh, extensively explored uh, to ascertain if uh, the client was uh, uh, screened and then linked to the OVC partner for OVC services. Uh, I noticed that um, he is a firstborn and also there's also a younger brother. I don't know if it should be the younger sister, but there's a sibling also who is HIV and uh, also on treatment. So I wanted to find out if both have been linked to benefit from the OVC services. Uh, that is if at all there is a partner uh, providing a service. I wanted to find out about that. So if that has not been done, perhaps that's the other thing that we can also uh, try to check. So both of them actually is 17 and they're eligible for them to benefit from the OVC uh, program. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sinyangwe. So the facility is uh, in Okwimi, a zone rural health center. So we'll find out from the presenter if uh, there's a partner that is offering OVC services once we uh, reconvene in the, in the, main, in the main group. Um, I've seen uh, some hands that are raised. Uh, you can kindly just unmute and uh, go ahead and uh, make your contribution. Uh, thank you, Doc. Uh, hope I'm loud and clear. Loud and clear, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, my name is Max Mumbai, and I'm the Adolescent and Young Persons Ambassador under the HIV Search. Yeah, I, I, I feel uh, these questions are really, really coming from uh, a rural setup of which uh, we have visited some health facilities and um, what kind of DSP model should uh, our colleague who's a young person be on. I think for me, I feel the scholar uh, DSP is ideal in her situation. But again, when we look at the other aspect of her being in boarding school, um, really brings up uh, a lot of factors maybe that would hinder her from uh, being adherent to treatment, such as uh, the privacy aspect. Uh, how, how, how does she uh, take her medication? Maybe there, there may be four or five in the hostels. Maybe she, she feels shy to, to, to take uh, the medication. And I feel we also, there's also a need to bring in interventions on how we can strengthen uh, the guidance and counseling teachers in terms of 
boarding schools because uh, these are, this has been the area which has uh, really lagged behind in terms of uh, uh, our partnership and programming when we, we look at issues uh, surrounding uh, with HIV. And it's not only boarding schools, also the tertiary institutions. Uh, as I speak now, I'm in Livingston, uh, visiting some uh, health facilities just to appreciate the challenges and see how uh, we can present these cases. And already there's um, a young person who's, who's in university, she's facing a similar challenge. So she, she was trying to find how, how can she be taking medication if they're about four or five, six in the hostel. So uh, I feel we have to uh, strengthen that capacity of the, the guidance and counseling. Uh, department in these schools. I said, Chair, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mumba. We've got uh, a few comments in the in the chat. So we've got one from uh, uh, Jerome uh, Chola that says, safer sex behaviors and knowledge on resistant strains from other sexual partners uh, as the girl is sexually active and suspected to be a source of new infection which gives us an idea to say that this girl may be having unprotected sex. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Chiwende uh, says Cola DSD is ideal for this child. Um, I think that has been taken note of. We've got another comment from Pauline uh, that says lack of privacy to keep and take medication is one of the major barriers to, for adolescents living in boarding schools where privacy is almost non-existent. So I think better management of HIV-infected adolescents integrated into boarding schools through, for example, training school faculty perso uh, personnel on how to support students and pupils and allow them privacy for taking their uh, medications. Uh, thank you very much for those submissions. Um, I think uh, Mr. Chibende has uh, given another comment, which is similar to the one Pauline has just uh, given. Um, is there anybody else who would like to make a submission? There's a hand that is raised. Mr. Mumba, would you like to make another comment or this is an old hand? Sorry, this is an old hand. Okay, Chilofia has a comment. Please go ahead and uh, make your comment. Okay, uh, so my submission is just in addition to what many other people have mentioned. Um, I think this would be one of the models we really want to scale up. So I know that in the past we had um, a health uh, a health personnel placed in in most of these boarding schools for those emergency treatments, who would either be a nurse and someone mentioned uh, maybe a head teacher or something. So we could also just try and see how we do dots in these health facilities and drugs are kept within that clinic, for example. And any student um, who's affected in that area would just walk in at any time and request for a pill at a time that they agree with this, um, this clinician because it would also help us just uh, be on point in monitoring these children rather than waiting for them to return for holidays. Uh, and by this, I mean, if we are supposed to be uh, getting any samples from them and 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 run. We could actually make it a, a, a mini center for the period that they are there, seeing that they spend longer times or periods uh, there. So that was my submission. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Shulafia. We'll take um, one more comment uh, in under one minute, Dr. Kaveta. Uh, please make the comment, and then we can have uh, Daniel. To give that uh, to give their comment as well, uh, and we can go back to the main session. Dr. Kaveta. Dr. Kaveta, are you still with us? It seems Dr. Kaveta is uh, not with us at the moment. Uh, Daniel Ngosa. You can give your um, comment. Okay, so thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I just wanted to put it in the scenario where, where I experienced uh, uh, a child who was uh, HIV positive, and then this child used to go to the boarding school. As we all know, these people are going to the boarding school, they are adult enough, and they are sexually active. 
So when we are we do counseling to them, they do understand they have to be taking the drugs, but they are scared to take it in the dormitories because they are going to be laughed at by the friends and the like. So we all know that we have matrons and patrons in school. So those are the people that we can use because those they hack like mothers and fathers to to the pupils. So this child just said to say, I have a madam that I'm very close to and uh, she treats me like a mom. So we asked her, is it okay that you can share your, your status? Then she was like, yes, she accepted. So what she used to do, she would take three, four pills every day. Uh, after every four days or maybe just for a week, she'll put it in the bed, in the, in the, in the locker, then she'll be taking that. Sometimes she'll be just going as if she's just visiting because the teacher used to stay in the compound. So it was very easy for her to conduct her ART. And even when uh, the ART department visited her, it was very easy to talk to her because she just went at the madame place and then they talked to her, they even got her the hell. So we can also make sure we can talk to these children who are going to the boarding school, ask them, Maybe there is a teacher that they love, that they love with, and they can be able to disclose the status who stand within their school premises and they can be able to access the ART. In case it's not everybody that can have a clinician, that can have a nurse to provide those services to them, but they, there can be a person where they can share a status and they can access their ART at the daily basis, I submit. Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Ngosa. So I know an, uh, a number of people uh, want to speak and uh, have uh, posted in the, in, the, in the chat. We've taken note of uh, the comments and the contributions that have made, been made in the chat. But uh, in view of time, we'll be moving back to the main session and uh, we can have uh, uh, our closing remarks. So it seems we still have a few more minutes. So I noticed um, Madalisa Sakala wanted to give a comment. If you're still on the call, please feel free to make your comment. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, the comment that I wanted to make, I think um, uh, my previous two uh, colleagues have spoken more about it. So. It's uh, more on the uh, being having ex having had experience in boarding school. I think a big part of this um, lies with um, the peers. A lot of peer pressure and um, a lot of adolescents thinking of how and what their friends think about them. So if we can have a, a services that are inclined towards uh, inclusiveness of uh, these uh, adolescents and uh, uh, bring about uh, an environment of tolerance towards the friends, I think that would be very good. Another one is um, the previous speaker talked about a clinician that is to be based in these, uh, in the body school that would give medication and then refer to a clinic outside. That is also good, but uh, I realized from where I was, these clinicians would just be one. And so whenever one student goes and sees them, then automatically the school will think, no, this one is going for this and that. And that's where the bullying and the, all the type of um, uh, suggestions come from. So if, if we could increase our, the, the, the number of, uh, like the previous talk at, uh, said, uh, the teachers who are able to handle drugs and actually give drugs to these uh, uh, adolescents instead of the adolescents keeping a whole bottle that is significant in the locker. That would be very nice. Then um, my last point is towards uh, condom use. I know it's a very um, hot issue debated when you start giving out condoms in schools, especially schools that have young children. I think that needs to be looked at and that would, if it would be put in school policies and 
maybe put out for the PTA for parents to discuss. I think that would greatly help our clients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. Um, in under 20 seconds, would anybody want to make a quick comment? We'll be leaving the breakout session very soon. Okay, it seems we don't have anyone. So we will be going back to the main uh, room and uh, we're going to have one uh, uh, zone uh, give us their um, Thank you very much and welcome back uh, to the main room. Um, I'm going to request, um, and I'm picking at random here, just Western Province to share with us what recommendations they had, and uh, uh, we can take it up from there. Western Province, would you tell us uh, what recommendations you had? Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair. This is Dr. Lushinga. I would like the Western Province breakout session. So I'll share with you some of the recommendations that came out from the team as we discussed. Uh, I think most of the speakers uh, made contributions on the first three questions. So on the first part, it came out that uh, a multi-month dispensation DST model would be good for this client who is in boarding school. And uh, perhaps the 3MMD or even something else modified um, considering now also that she has uh, a high viral load, so we are hesitant to put on 6MMG. But that, that particular DSD model was, was recommended. Um, but then as per facility, there may be other scholar models that, that could actually be implemented that are more friendly with uh, schedules at school and the hours that she's more available to come for ESC sessions or even the drug pickups. Um, then on the second question, it came out that the matrons at school or even the guidance teachers, uh, the client should be encouraged to disclose a status to, to one of those or both so that we can now share confidentiality there and these can act as, uh, as guardians on campus. They can help to remind the client to take her medication or indeed if there's any complication in case she gets sick, these individuals can be there to help out. On further social issues, it came out that the client should be encouraged to use condoms so that she can prevent reinfection in herself or indeed infecting other people since it came out in the case that she is actually sexually active. Again, a disclosure here would help in terms of the caregivers for the clients that we need to be sure that there's been full disclosure to this 17-year-old uh, girl. Does she fully understand what is HIV? And why is she on lifelong ART? Those are some of the points that, that came out as we discussed this case here in Western Province. Over and thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Lushinga, for those uh, recommendations. Again, I would request all the um, hubs to just compile all the recommendations that uh, were discussed during the breakout sessions and share them with uh, the UTH hub here so that we can uh, compile everything and uh, share it with our colleagues uh, in Okwimi. Mr. Mlambia, are you happy with the recommendations that have been made so far? Of course, we will be sharing a detailed uh, 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 list of recommendations that have been made from everyone. Mr. Mlambia? Yes, we, we are OK with the contributions that have been made so far. Uh, in addition, Eastern Province also gave a number of recommendations. So we really appreciate. We'll be looking forward to receiving other recommendations from Southern uh, province those that we have not heard from. Thank you, Andob. Thank you very much. So uh, we will request, I think we're running uh, over time now, I will request our didactic presenter to just uh, give us some uh, final comments and then we uh, will break off. Uh, Dr. Msonda. 
Um, thank you, um, Dr. Chantan. Thank you, everyone, for all the very valuable suggestions you've made. Um, I think all of them are they are feasible, but I think what we need to remember is to um, assess our environment and make sure that our whatever intervention or method we're choosing is tailor-made to suit the client. We have to look at various factors, their lifestyle, their choices, their environment, and even their own personal capability or ability and willingness to take the drug. And then now we start to look at what will work well. If this is a person who's very closed or reserved, is this will it be easy for them to confide in somebody? So we have to look at all those ways. But I think um, all these suggestions will work and they can be feasible. But I think we should just make sure that it's client specific and um, decided with the client. I think that's the only um, thing I can say over this, uh, this part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Msonda. So we will be breaking off now until uh, the next time that we meet. Uh, let us all remember that uh, we are moving towards uh, client-centered uh, uh, medical care. So like uh, Dr. Msonda said, uh, we should tailor our interventions to uh, the particular environment that we're in and also the particular patient that we, that we do have. Thank you once more for joining us and um, until, um, until next week. Our next uh, topic will be mental health and uh, OVC. Oh, and OVC. Yeah. So uh, let us look forward to that presentation um, next week. Thank you. Over and out.